So hi everyone, I'm Bo Yuan, and uh, I would like to have a brief introduction of our group's uh, work on the algorithm hardware co-design for the efficient deep learning. And uh, we know that right now the deep learning is uh, used in many, many important applications like uh, in, in autonomous driving and recently uh, uh, Google and DeepMind, they use deep learning to do predict the, uh, the foldy, the structure of the protein and uh, OpenAI and uh, Microsoft, uh, they, they invented the GPT-3 and it can, it's a very powerful natural language processing model. And we also know that AlphaGo has already showed a very uh, huge social impact. And the deep learning is, uh, is very, right now a very popular topic, but from the perspective, the uh, practical deployment, they are experiencing or facing the efficiency problem. This is because when we want to deploy the deep neural networks, they're kind of very expensive. And this is because the deep neural network is either storage intensive, computation intensive, or both. And like for those that, uh, uh, deep learning model used in the natural language processing or using the speech recognition um, applications. They typically have a very large model size and for the computer vision models like the convolution neural work, they're very computation intensive. And also the reason the uh, trending for those the so-called vision transformers, they, they even can make the, the, uh, the deep learning model for the computer vision become very large. And so such the large model size, it's further uh, caused the energy efficiency challenge because that if we cannot like fit the entire model on the SRAM, and in that case, so we need to have the frequent access to DRAM and that causes the very huge energy cost. And such huge energy cost will cause either the deployment of the deep learning model on the edge device or in the data center become the very inefficient, like in the, in the, at the edge, so the high energy consumption will quickly drain up the battery of our mobile embedded devices. And in the data center, so uh, the energy is not a problem, but the operational cost, the, the, like the electricity bill caused by the energy consumption, that is, a very, that is very expensive. Like for AlphaGo first generation of the Google's AlphaGo to run a, one gold game, so they need to char be charged for three thousand uh, dollars per game electric bill. So that is very expensive. And uh, further, so from the perspective of the uh, green computing or the, the or the the, uh, if you, uh, the the environment protection. So right now the in the executing or the training the deep learning model, especially for those large scale deep learning model. So it will. Uh, have the very severe, uh, severe the, the carbon emissions. So according to the survey and analysis from the University of Massachusetts, uh, Amherst, so they found that, so if we want to train a large scale, the state of art uh, natural language processing deep learning model, so the, uh, the corresponding carbon emissions can be as high as the five cars in the, in the entire lifetime. So that is a very huge, uh, cons uh, consumption. And uh, so that is it's a kind of terrible carbon footprint and uh, we need to address this problem. And the even worse, so if you want to further pursue the higher accuracy of a model, because that is the, the Everson community that they always want, that is the priority, the top metric they want to optimize. And in that case, we want to, because of the very good scalability of the deep learning models. So we want to use more training data and then further scale up our model. In that case, the corresponding storage cost and computational cost will be even higher. Like for the, in the computer vision domain. So right now we are, change, we are transferring from the convolution network to the vision transformer and have the, the deeper and the larger model. And for the NLP domain, so the GPT-2 have only 1.5 billion parameters, but for the GPT-3 right now we already have the over 100 billion parameters. That is very huge. And actually, so just uh, this October, so the Microsoft uh, together with the NVIDIA, they have announced a new generation of the large scale natural language model. It has already have the, the 500 billion parameters. So that is an extremely very huge model. And the corresponding uh, operational cost is very, very big. And uh, so actually, so that means it caused the, uh, the demands for the efficient deep learning so across the entire intelligence spectrum. So like in the 
a very uh, at the edge and the edge mobile devices. So we need to use uh, to pursue such so-called tiny ML that you and like the, the Google and the and the, the Facebook already provide the corresponding framework and like the, the TensorFlow Lite to uh, enable the, the deploy the, the deep learning model in the very resource constrained devices. And also like in the mobile end or in the gateway, in the server and also further to the cloud, to the data center. So the, if it, the, the demands of the efficient deep learning is very, very important to see in both the inference phase and for the training phase. So how to achieve the efficient deep learning? So typically we have the two avenues. And first is to at the algorithm level, we can develop the more efficient and compact models. And typically we have the two types of methodologies. First is to use the model compression. You have a kind of the very high accurate model, but we want to compress size without sacrifice the accuracy. That is com model compression. And another is the so-called neural architecture search. So we want to use the machine learning algorithm to find the suitable uh, deep learning model. And uh, for the, and the hardware side, so we can further develop the customized specialized hardware implementation for the deep learning. And a very famous uh, uh, effort is from the Google. They proposed the tensor processing unit, the TPU. And that's based on the digital CMOS implications. And also recently there are many emerging technologies like the MAM resistor and the MRAM. So using those the analog bay or the optical computing, use those the analog emerging technologies, we can also build the high, uh, low, ultra low power, ultra high speed deep learning hardware. So in my, this brief talk, I will introduce our group's explanation on the model algorithm side and the, for the model compression efforts and the hardware side for the digital CMOS implementation of those the specialized deep learning hardware accelerator. Uh, so for the model compression, so typically we have the three families of method. First is sparsification. We want to make the model become sparse. We can prune some unnecessary weights and the connections. And the second is quantization. So we can reduce the number of the number of bits that need to represent the weight. The classical, we need the 32 or the 16 floating point presentation, but because the photo tolerant property of the deep learning models, we can use just the eight bits or the four bits or the even two bits, like, like that is what IBM recently proposed, a two bit deep learning inference uh, accelerated chip. And also another family is the low rank decomposition, low rank approximation. We can use the, those that the linear algebra technique to decompose or the factorize the, the deep learning model to the sum of the small uh, uh, fragments and then to reduce the, the computational and the storage cost. So, uh, in the recent four years of my group, we explored the uh, algorithm and hardware co-design and along the two different directions. First is for the dense to when, whether the model can be dense or sparse. And another direction is whether the model itself is, can be structured or un unstructured. So actually, so this, these two directions, they form the four different topics and areas. And uh, in my talk, I will uh, focus on introducing so our recent exploration on the specialized sparsity and the generalized sparsity and the, the low rank decomposition for the corresponding algorithm and hardware co-design. So the first part of my talk is about the sparse perspective of the efficient deep learning. So the sparsity right now is very, very important. So according to the, this October, so Google's their new announcement for their pathway, so Google's next generation AI architecture. So the third optimization point is they want to introduce is the sparsity. So in, in the Jeff Dean's uh, blog, so they clearly mentioned that the, the pathway is kind of sparsely well designed to make the, the execution of the deep learning model become the very efficient because the current model is kind of very dense and inefficient. So regarding the sparsity, so actually from the perspective of the practical deployment, we can roughly categorize them to the three different types of sparsity. The first one I would like to call is kind of the sort of reference structured sparsity. And for such structure, it was shown in this, in this slide. So like the, for, uh, like the weight matrix of deep learning layer. So each row or each column it entirely can be can be pruned or can be sparsed. And the such kind of sparsity is very good for to be run 
on the off-shelf the CPU and the GPU without any modification for the underlying compiler or the using any specialized hardware accelerator. And uh, so it can provide the okay sparsity and uh, serve some the small accuracy job. So that is kind of a, a key focus in deep learning community, algorithm community. And another type of structure sparsity I call this a hardware friendly sparsity. So for this type of sparsity, it's still, we can still observe some of the, the uh, spatial pattern in your, in your sparse models. But such pattern is not like in the row wise or column wise. And this, so for this type of the pattern, spatial pattern, so it can bring the better, a higher sparsity and the better accuracy. But the corresponding penalty is that you need to design the specialized hardware accelerator or you need to modify the underlying software compiler to, so, to support, to adapt for such your proposed structure of sparsity. And the third type of is the unstructured sparsity. This is the, the very generous sparsity. Doesn't require any uh, prior constraint of the, the spatial pattern. And uh, so it is kind of, it is, that is the, typically that is general for the end user. No, we don't need to impose any constraint for the user. And it can bring the very high sparsity and uh, can bring the very high accuracy. But the drawback is that for such type of sparsity, we must design the very customized, the specialized hardware to support such unstructured sparsity. And uh, we explore both of, uh, all of these three types of sparsity and for the software-friendly structured sparsity. So we explored the channel pruning. And uh, so this is all kind of extensively studied in current deep learning community because it can bring the measurable speed up because for the algorithm side, researchers, they don't know the detail of the hardware, underlying hardware. So they just want to know so whether we can have the speed up on the CPU or on, on the GPU. And so that means that for the convolutional work, we can just uh, remove the, the, those the unimportant channels or the filters. And in that case, we can get the immediate speed up. So all in this year, New York's, uh, of our, our paper, the cheap, the channel independence based pruning, we proposed to identify the linear dependency of the, the uh, among the different feature maps. And then using this way to get to know which one is the unimportant filter and which one is unimportant feature. And to do that, so actually we utilized the, the nuclear norm to uh, set the L1 norm, the signal values of the, the flattened feature maps and to identify the importance of the different feature maps. And uh, so why we use that? Because we observe that as compared to the rank, another very common use the, the L0 norm for the singular value to rank, uh, to determine the importance. The nuclear norm can provide the rich information because it's kind of a soft metric and provide the much more meaningful information to know the, the, impo the relative importance among the different uh, channels. And so this method is showed a very good performance. You can see that as compared to the existing state of our work. So our pruning method can provide the, the higher accuracy and the higher computational cost and the model size, the parameters reductions. And for the same uh, baseline models and, uh, and the data set, on the data set, same data set. So for our another exploration for the hardware structure sparsity, so I will just quickly skip that. And actually we proposed that the perm DNA and the perm CNN, and that is we introduced the new type of the structure sparsity called the permutated sparsity. And actually this sparsity is inspired by the design of the LDPC codes, the regular LDPC codes. We observe, we record the history of the, the LDPC codes from the irregular LDPC to the regular LDPC, and we inspired by this the, the, the shift, and we propose that for the sparse matrix of the deep learning model, we can also improve, uh, introduce the, the permutation uh, spatial pattern. In that case, we can still have the, the very high accuracy, but with the very low cost, the sparsity overhead. And uh, based on this idea, we implemented the corresponding hardware architecture, and this is the, the layout of the, the pro P under the using the CMOS 28 nanometers. And the third part of our exploration on the sparsity is about the unstructured sparsity. And this is a very challenging task because the for unstructured sparsity, it involves the two types of sparsity. One is the input sparsity. This is the, this is the result of the, the ReLU layer, and it is 
kind of data dependent is is kind of dynamic sparsity. And then that, another is the modal sparsity. This is outcome of the, the modal compression, and this is a static sparsity. So how do you properly integrate this two leverage this two type of spot together and avoid the the huge cost of the existing unstretched sparsity hardware? And uh, so that is the main goal of our of our paper. And uh, so you can see that the state of art uh, sparse CN hardware like the SPA ten from the uh, Purdue and the extensor from the Illinois. So actually, they already can achieve the very good performance for those two for the computational efficiency and data transfer efficiency. But a key drawback is that so they don't have the proper uh, uh, manipulation on the uh, on the non-zero data transfer. So they can remove the, the the zero data transfer, but they have still suffered a lot of the unnecessary non-zero data transfer that causes a lot of the energy. Uh, consumption overhead. And for our work, so we propose a new data flow called the GoSpark, the Global Optimized Sparse CN Accelerator. And our key idea is that, so we utilize the pre-known sparse information to avoid the non-necessary data transfer. And we also first discover that actually the pairing relationship between the non-zero weight and the non-zero activation, actually we can pre-calculate it. And using such pre-calculated information, so we can very uh, efficiently identify those non-zero parallels. That is the most important task when we want to design the SPAR CN accelerator. And so according to this idea, we developed the GoSPAR and published in this year, ISCAR, the top computer architecture conference. And uh, here's our uh, evaluation results. So like when we exclude in the DRAM, uh, over uh, consumption, so as compared to SPA 10, so we can achieve the two to five energy efficiency improvement across the different workloads. And uh, if we include in the DRAM as compared to the, some of the existing works like the, the MITs, IRIS, and IRIS V2, we can see that for the either uh, for both the on chip uh, uh, energy efficiency and uh, also the entire, including DRAM, the entire system energy efficiency and the power consumptions. Uh, our solution is, is much better than the existing state of art works. So the next part, I will ha uh, have a brief introduction for our work on the low rank perspective of efficient deep learning. And uh, for this, this direction, we mainly focus on the the technique by using the tensor decomposition. So for the low recognition, we can either use the, the to explore the recognition, we can either use the metric decomposition or the tensor decomposition. But we here we emphasize on tensor decomposition because we believe that for those tensor format data, it is better to directly manipulate them on the tensor space instead of using the flattened metric space because that we need we may suffer some of the information loss when we use the matrix decomposition. And uh, a very good uh, advantage for the tensor decomposition is that they can pr provide a very high compression ratio, especially for the advanced uh, approach like the tensor train. So for the tensor train decomposition, it can uh, theoretically can achieve the very high compression ratio for those large scale machine learning model, like uh, more than 1000 uh, times the compression ratio for those that the uh, fully connected layer or the, for the recurrent neural work. So, but the existing works, it has some several uh, severe challenges. The first is about the computing redundancy. For example, for the tensor decomposition, so yes, it can achieve the very high, bring the very high compression ratio, but it suffers the very high computation redundancy. So essentially, actually, it trades the, the, uh, the computation for the space. And in that case, so actually, so the, the, the entire number of modifications in, during the inference for those tensor train based model, actually it increased. And to, to solve this problem, we, we proposed a new tensor train based inference engine. So we proposed the corresponding very compact computation scheme and it can significantly reduce computation redundancies. So in some of the workloads, it can save the 1000 times number of the multiplications. And based on this scheme, we we build the corresponding hardware architecture and implement that. So this is the example of our example, the, the compact computing scheme. And uh, we, based on this scheme, we designed the, using the CMOS 28 nanometer CMOS technology, designed the corresponding uh, 
examples, and this is a 16 p design examples can operate on the one, one gigahertz clock frequency. And here is the, the evaluation on the detailed workload on the different uh, layers. You can see that we can have the good area efficiency and energy efficiency. And as compared to the prior works from the Stanford, and also this is the, the uh, for the com uh, for the comparison with the, the another work in the from MIT on the convolution neural work uh, workload, we can achieve the, the high throughput improvement, air efficiency improvement, and energy efficiency improvement. And uh, based on our architectures, actually there's a work uh, the group from the Tsinghua University in China, the the further in, uh, fabricated chip based on our architecture and using the memory computing published in this year ISSCC. And their overall architecture is based on our, our, our work. And the second challenge is about the accuracy. So especially, so the current the most, all of the, the success of the, the, like the tensor chain approach, they are based on the fully connected layer. Because for those lay, fully connected layers, they have the, can have the higher model redundancy. But for those the convolution layers, so typically when you use the tensor decomposition approaches, you will suffer the accuracy loss. Okay, and in that case, so the corresponding benefit is not as comparable to the structured pruning method. And so how do you solve this problem? This is a, this is a fundamental challenge for the tensor decomposition approach using deep learning. And to address this problem, so we propose the, uh, a unified optimization form, framework. And our key idea is to gradually impose the, our desired low tensor rank structure on the target models and uh, we, we formulated the entire problem as the optimization problem. And then we found that we can use the ADMM optimization technique instead of a direct tensor decomposition to solve this problem. And we decompose the entire, our entire task to two phase. First is the ADMM uh, added regularization. And then the second is the, the, is the, the fine tuned uh, decompose and fine tune. And based on this approaches, so the accuracy can be significantly improved. And uh, also this is a very general framework can be applied for any low rank decomposition method, like the, not just the tensor train, but also like the SVD, target decomposition, tensor ring, CP, and so on. And this work is published in the this year's CVPR. And so this is the, our performance uh, evaluated on the image net for the resident 18. So you can see that as compared to the prior low rank uh, or the tensor decomposition or the metric decomposition approaches or the structural pruning approaches, our, our method can shift the higher accuracy and with the, the, the lower computational cost. This is about the CNN workload. And also this is on the RN workload for the video recognition. Also, we can see that as compared to the prior works, tensor decomposition works, so we can achieve the much better uh, top one accuracy with the, the, the lower number, uh, the smaller number of parameters and the higher compression ratio. Okay, so this is a summary of my talk. So actually the efficient deep learning can be explored from different perspective, either from the algorithm side or the hardware side. So for the methodology, we can explore the using the sparsity or using the, the low rankness. And the, so when we consider that with the different angles, actually there are many interesting interactions can happen. Uh, the algorithm hardware, the sparse or the dense, the, the classical hardware technique or the, the emerging technique, uh, the digital and the analog and so on. So there are many, many interesting and exciting opportunities are, are waiting for us to explore. Okay, thank you. And that's all of my talk. So.